Hey, how are you doing? Uh, we did three hours of teaching. It wasn't even me doing all the teaching this morning. In fact, hardly any of it, but we did three hours to a camera live over Zoom because of the whole COVID thing. But I'm going to do a bit more video and it's going to be a nice, relaxed, chilled out look at the cardiovascular system. So the aim is, hey, let's start at the heart. Let's follow the blood vessels out from the heart follow them out to the upper limbs, lower limbs, up into the head, just like a general overview of where they go, what they do, and then we'll look at eh, some of the veins as they come back again and how they get back to the heart. But I'll go to all the veins because there's a lot, but okay, is that okay? Yeah, right, good, let's do that. Now, this might not actually be the best, model for this. Bum, ba, bum, ba, bum, bum, bum. Bum, ba, bum, ba, bum. Hey, yeah, no, it's probably fine. It's probably fine. Aren't these things beautiful? I mean, the human body is beautiful and they're a very pretty rendition of them. Okay, the heart. So the heart is the pump of the circulatory system and the circulatory system is essentially a closed loop. So the heart receives blood and then pumps it back out again. It's not just a single pump really, it's kind of two pumps in one. Uh, one side, uh, the right side, is pumping blood to the lungs and the left side then is pumping blood all around the body. So the left side tends to be a bit thicker. The muscle is thicker here, it's got a bit of bigger job to do. So, let's just do the lungs first I guess. So actually see this here. So the right ventricle of the heart is here and it's pushing blood out through this large tube here. This is the pulmonary trunk. Now it's blue, but it's an artery because the right side of the heart has received blood from the body. So that blood is poorly oxygenated. So it's blue, or kind of a dark red anyway. We won't get into that argument. But this blue vessel then is the pulmonary trunk. So arteries leave the heart and veins return to the heart. Their content, you know, the, whether their blood is oxygenated or deoxygenated, is irrelevant. It's an anatomical thing of whether they're going to or from the heart. This is why we're starting from the heart. So the vessels leaving the heart are arteries. So the pulmonary trunk then takes the blood and then it splits into left. We can see that the, this is the left side of the body. We can see the left pulmonary artery here. And actually we have to look around there to see the, the right pulmonary artery. So the two pulmonary arteries send blood to the lungs. And those, they branch, 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 branch throughout the lungs. And blood, um, so it sends its carbon dioxide and what have you out through the lungs. So you exhale carbon dioxide and then you inhale air and the oxygen from the air is taken through from the, from the gas, from the air to the capillaries of the lungs. And then these red vessels then, they're carrying well oxygenated blood, which is painted red. And these are actually pulmonary veins, red pulmonary veins draining blood from the lungs back to the heart. And these pulmonary veins enter the left side of the heart, the left atrium, and then the left ventricle. So that's why they're red. And now we're back in the heart. And the left ventricle then, this is gonna send blood out through this huge great big blood vessel here, the aorta. A really big, a really important blood vessel. And the aorta, is going to ascend. Now its first branches are actually, we haven't still haven't left the heart yet, its first branches are the coronary arteries. We have right and left coronary arteries. So the coronary arteries supply the muscle of the heart with blood because they're very active, they need a lot of oxygen and glucose and what have you, and they're working literally all day long for your entire life. So the coronary arteries branch from the aorta and go around the heart. Now as the aorta continues, so it ascends superiorly, it actually ascends and then loops posteriorly and to the left. So if I take the heart out, you can see the aorta curving around there posteriorly into the left. So it's going to run along the posterior thoracic wall, just to the left of the vertebrae. 
But before it gets there, it gives off three major branches. So this is the arch of the aorta. We have the ascending aorta, the arch of the aorta, and then the, the descending thoracic aorta, because it's in the thorax. The first branch then of the thoracic, of the, the first branch of the arch of the aorta is the brachiocephalic trunk. Um, maybe called the innominate artery by elderly surgeons that you might speak to, but it's not a word I come across very often um, in different parts of the world, that might be different. But the brachiocephalic artery extends superiorly and to the right. Brachiocephalic, cephalic head, brachium, arm or upper limb. So the brachiocephalic artery is going to send blood to the upper limb and to the head. Which one should we do first? Let's do the upper limb. The upper limb. So the brachiocephalic artery, brachiocephalic trunk, is going to give off the subclavian artery. So the, this is the clavicle here. Here's the clavicle. So the subclavian artery is going to run sub the clavicle. It's going to run inferior to the clavicle. And then essentially we have one artery running out through the first part of the upper limb. But we change its name as we go along. So we have the subclavian artery then becomes the axillary artery as it runs through the axilla. The axilla is your armpit. And then the axillary artery becomes the brachial artery when it's in the brachium. This being the brachium here, the upper arm. So you can, you can probably actually, so here's bicep and triceps. If you feel around in there, you can find, ooh, you can feel some, you can feel some things, some long structures. You've got some nerves in there and you've got some blood vessels. And if you're careful and you get your fingertips in the right place, you will feel the pulse of the brachial artery. So the subclavian artery becomes the axillary artery, becomes the brachial artery, and then as we get to the elbow, it splits. So it runs anterior to the elbow, protected by some muscles, which is sensible, and then it divides into two. Kind of like this. Now in the forearm or the antebrachium, we have two bones. We have the radius and the ulna. The radius is on your, on your thumb side. So the arteries take on the names of the bones. So the radial artery runs here and the ulna artery runs here. So the, the radial artery runs to your thumb. So this is the pulse that you can palpate if you put your fingers there. That's the radial artery. Now the ulna artery runs essentially towards the little finger and you can, you can find the ulna pulse, but it's harder because it tends to be covered by more muscles and connected tissues and that sort of thing. Um, and then in the hands, they, we have these arcades, these palmar arcades, but that's it. So brachial artery, ulna and radial arteries to the hands. So that's where the subclavian artery goes. That's the upper limb done. All right, let's get rid of this one. Ooh. Brachiocephalic. We've done the brachio bit. What about the cephalic bit? All right, can you see it? Oop. This is the cephalic bit. This is the common carotid artery. Now, when we think about the carotid arteries, because there are a few of them, we never say that's the carotid artery. There is a common carotid artery. There is an internal carotid artery. There is an external carotid artery but there's not a carotid artery, anatomically speaking, right? Because anatomy is about being accurate. Um, so this is the common carotid artery and the common carotid artery extends up to the neck and then kind of just beneath the jaw there, if you, you can palpate your pulse in there, the pulse that you're feeling there is actually the external carotid artery. So the common carotid artery ascends and then splits into two. The external carotid artery is going to supply blood to the face and the internal carotid artery goes into the skull and is going to be one of the arteries that supplies blood to the brain. The other artery that supplies blood to the brain actually comes from the subclavian artery and runs up uh, 
runs up the cervical vertebrae to get into the skull. Vertebral arteries come from the subclavian artery and go to the brain. The common carotid artery on the right comes from the brachiocephalic trunk. Are we still keeping it simple? I don't know. I think, I think it's okay. All right, so that's the brachiocephalic trunk. Two more arteries come from the arch of the aorta, but now that we've looked at some stuff, this will get a lot easier. So the second branch from the arch of the aorta is the left common carotid artery. And you know where that goes and what that does, because we just described what the right one did. And the left one does the same thing. So that's the left common carotid artery. And then the third branch from the arch of the aorta is the left subclavian artery. So that again is going to loop over, it's going to dive deep to the clavicle and it's going to supply blood to the left upper limb. All right, so we're done with these. These get called some of the great vessels. Now the, the aorta, as I said, it descends within the thorax. As it descends, it gives off intercostal arteries, um, which run around with the ribs to supply blood to the thoracic cage and various other bits and bobs. But in terms of major vessels, we're now going to take out all of the abdominal viscera, and most, of the ab most of the abdominal viscera maybe, transverse colon, see what we can see. Okay, so the thoracic aorta passes through the diaphragm, there's kind of a gap at the back of the diaphragm and runs through that gap to get to the abdomen. And if I take this off, we can now see the abdominal aorta. So um, it changes its name from, well, it's still the aorta, but you just describe this bit of the aorta as the abdominal aorta. And again, it's on the posterior abdominal wall, but can you see it's pretty much lying anterior to the vertebrae. As the abdominal aorta descends, it gives off one, two, three anterior branches. So these are running anteriorly and they supply blood to the gut and other viscera associated with the gut. So we have the first branch is the celiac trunk. The second branch is the superior mesenteric artery and the third branch is the inferior mesenteric artery. And they will all supply the stomach, or rather each one will supply. They will all supply parts of the gastrointestinal tract. So they will supply organs such as the spleen, the pancreas, the liver, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, and whatnot, all right? So those are the three major branch, these are the three anterior branches of the abdominal aorta. And you may well have noticed, if you were looking carefully, there are also some lateral branches. Now, there are pairs of lateral branches. These are the kidneys here, and you can see some arteries here which are a little bit hidden by the veins, but these then are the renal arteries. The left and right renal arteries are lateral branches of the abdominal aorta carrying blood to the kidneys. The kidneys, like the lungs, are organs that process blood. So they see a lot of blood. They don't need a lot of blood to survive. They process that blood. So they have a high throughput of blood. But we can't see the whole thing there. You can see how big the veins are, the renal veins, and the renal arteries are kind of similar. Um, as we descend, yeah, see these? Whoop. So these are arteries that are running, they're descending down towards the pelvis. And they'll take slightly different paths in male and female pelvises. These are running through the inguinal ligament, I can see. So this would be a male pelvis, I think. Although, yeah, well, we haven't got a uterus, which is always a good sign of a male pelvis, isn't it? Um, these lateral branches then are gonadal arteries. In this case, testicular arteries, but in the female uh, anatomy, these would be ovarian arteries. So you can see why they get called gonadal arteries as well, because that's the catch-all for both terms. So those are two pairs of lateral arteries from the abdominal aorta. And it's also sending off other um, segmental branches to the posterior abdominal wall and bits and bobs. But those aren't major. Okay. Still with me? Right.
Let's have another a closer look down here. We're now at the end of the aorta. This huge great big blood vessel comes to an end by dividing into two other arteries. These are the common iliac arteries. We might say this is a, um, a final bifurcation, a terminal bifurcation of the aorta into left and right common iliac arteries. And these are gonna descend down and give off blood branches to supply blood to the pelvis and to the lower limbs. So in fact, the common iliac artery isn't very long. Can you see how here it divides again? So the common iliac artery runs from here to here, and then it divides to give off an internal iliac artery and an external iliac artery. The internal iliac artery, and there's a left one and a right one, those are going to dive into the pelvis and will give off a number of branches that supply blood to the viscera, to the organs, inside the pelvis, whereas the external iliac artery will, so what we've got here is we've got the inguinal ligament, there's a ligament running across here. The external iliac artery will run deep to this inguinal ligament and when it passes the inguinal ligament, we change its name because we like to do that. When it, when it passes into the lower limb, it becomes the femoral artery. So it's the same blood vessel, it's continuing down, we just change its name at that point and it becomes the femoral artery. And the femoral artery is the artery supplying blood to the lower limb. And we're gonna change its name um, a couple more times. Right, uh, I'm gonna need an upper, a lower limb, aren't I? Okay, so when we get down to the foot, we'll have finished our overview of the arteries. So here's the the inguinal ligament I was talking about, and here's the femoral artery, and look, it disappears. So you can palpate your femoral artery, the pulse of it, if you're careful, but it disappears deep to these muscles. Let's take these muscles off. Ah, and it's going to run that away. Um, it gives off a deep branch to this big muscle, um, the quadriceps muscle, but essentially, the femoral artery runs distally or inferiorly and medially, so towards the inside of your leg. Look, there's the big toe there. And there's a gap in the muscles. It runs through that gap in the muscles to get to the back of your knee, the popliteal fossa. See, there it is there. So the femoral artery, when it passes through that gap in the muscle to enter the popliteal fossa, we change its name and it becomes the popliteal artery. You can palpate the pulse of that as well. It might take a bit of a, bit of a while to find that. And as it descends, so here's the, the popliteal artery here. And as it runs through the popliteal fossa, you can see it giving off a number of branches. These are to the knee. But as we pass the knee, as we pass the knee joint in the popliteal fossa, um, the popliteal artery continues as the posterior tibial artery. And the posterior tibial artery then is the artery of the calf. So it's running down deep to these big calf muscles and it's going to eventually run medially around the ankle to form the plantar arteries of the sole of the foot. Now, the reason it changes its name and becomes the posterior tibial artery is because we have an anterior tibial artery forming here. So look, there's the shin, top of the foot shin. Pop that muscle out. Ah, now in there, we can see the anterior tibial artery. So you could say that the popliteal artery divides into posterior and anterior tibial arteries. When we actually look at the anatomy, it's a little bit more awkward than that, but that's the best way of thinking about it. So the anterior tibial artery is the artery of the shin. The posterior tibial artery is the artery of the calf. And the anterior tibial, tibial artery will run down to the, 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 the dorsum of the foot. And those arteries will actually communicate a little bit. But that's it. That's the overview of the arterial supply throughout the human body. Up to the brain, down to the big toe. Um, not so bad. We can add a lot of detail to that, but we're not going to do that today because this is an introduction. We'll do that as we look at each area. What we will do now is consider the veins on their way back up, which are not on these models. So, first rule, veins tend to follow the artery. So, so there are veins that match the arteries that we've talked about. 
Um, but whilst we have one nice neat artery, when we're looking at the body, we often find that a pair of veins run with them and they interconnect and what have you. So that's the first bit of complexity. The other thing is that we tend to have not just um, the veins matching the artery, some of which we've seen, but we also have superficial veins in the skin, a whole bunch of other veins of which there are not arteries matching them. For example, in the, in the lower limb, we have the great saphenous vein uh, or the long saphenous vein and the short saphenous vein. These are very superficial. You see them in the skin. Those are the veins that tend to give rise to varicose veins. They're very, very superficial. Otherwise though, we have, you can see there's a popliteal vein. And as it passes through that gap in the muscle, it becomes, I shouldn't have put this back together. It becomes, what does it become? The femoral vein, yeah. So the femoral vein runs up here. There's the inguinal ligament again. When the femoral vein runs deep to the inguinal ligament, we change its name to the external iliac vein. Very good, very good. Um, and that follows up. So the, the great saphenous vein, for example, it stays within the skin. That's why we can't see it on this model because the skin has been removed. So the superficial veins have been removed. So the great saphenous vein actually runs all the way up the lower limb and drains its blood back into the, the femoral vein up here. Um, so, you know, you might have heard of deep vein thrombosis, a clot forming in the deep veins of the leg. This is what we're talking about. These deep veins covered by muscle in the lower limb, not the superficial veins. The superficial veins are the ones that become varicose. I'm getting a bit confused. I've got way too much stuff out here. Okay, so then the external iliac vein joins with the internal iliac vein, draining blood from the pelvis, and they become the common iliac vein. The left and right common iliac veins come together and form the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava ascends through the abdomen and look, we see a pair of lateral gonadal veins draining into them and we see a pair of renal veins draining into the inferior vena cava. But we don't see any anterior veins draining back into the vena cava. And the reason for that is that all the blood from the gastrointestinal tract drains to the liver. So the, the purpose of that is that the, the small intestine absorbs nutrients, for example, into the blood, that blood is then passed to the liver essentially for processing and management. Do you see? So there's no point sending the blood from the GI tract back to the inferior vena cava. No, you've got to send it back to the liver first and you do that through the portal vein. And then the liver surrounds the inferior vena cava. So the blood passes through the liver, the hepatocytes perform hundreds of functions on all of that stuff that you've been absorbing and then it passes that blood into the inferior vena cava. And then that part, the inferior vena cava passes up through the diaphragm, and then we're back to the heart. The inferior vena cava drains directly back into the right atrium, the right side of the heart. So that blood will then be passed to the lungs and round and round we go. Now, what about the upper part, the superior part? Well, I said that this was the inferior vena cava, this is the superior vena cava. So now we've got to think about blood going in that direction because it's draining into the heart. And the superior vena cava is also draining into the, the right atrium, the right side of the heart. So the superior and inferior vena cava both come up and join, both come up and drain into the right atrium. Now the superior vena cava then, all right, we have two brachiocephalic veins. We saw only one brachiocephalic artery, right? Just one brachiocephalic trunk, but we have two brachiocephalic veins and they're a little bit superficial to the arteries. So those two brachiocephalic veins, left and right, come together to form the superior vena cava. Now what forms the brachiocephalic veins? Again, brachiocephalic. So we have a subclavian vein here coming from the upper limb. So the blood from the upper limb drains in here and then here, this isn't a carotid vein, this is a jugular vein. And again, 
we don't have a jugular vein, we have an internal jugular vein and an external jugular vein. And this is the internal jugular vein. So the internal jugular vein is draining most of the blood from the brain and the face. And the internal jugular vein meets the subclavian vein. Those two come together and become the brachiocephalic vein. That happens on both sides. And as I said, the two brachiocephalic veins come together, form the superior vena cava and drain all that blood to the heart. Um, the external jugular vein, again, it's a very superficial one. You might see it in my neck here while I'm talking because when you use the muscles in your face a great deal, you're passing more blood flow through them and it kind of pops up and that sort of thing. But really that's kind of for a neck or jugular vein general video when we look at internal and external. Anyway, upper limb. You can't see any veins at all, but they are here in you. So again, we have ulnar and radial veins. We have deep veins, which match the arteries that we talked about. Ulnar and radial veins become a brachial vein, becomes an axillary vein, becomes a subclavian vein. Um, those are the deep veins. And then we also have um, superficial veins, which I don't think we can see very well on me. Anyway, there's, um, there's a basilic vein which runs over here, a cephalic vein that runs over there, a median cubital vein linking them together, and those two will drain back to the brachial or subclavian, or brachial, brachial and axillary or subclavian, anyway, they'll drain back to this major deep vein draining blood from the upper limb at some point, and we have covered that elsewhere if you want more detail. Is that it? That is... It, I think, that, that is an overview of the entire cardiovascular system, anatomically speaking, from the heart, following the blood out to the extremities, hands and feet, up to the brain, and then following the blood back again. Um, it's an overview, but honestly, we covered most of, we covered pretty much most of all of the major vessels that someone might need to know about. There is, there is more detail, there's a lot more detail and you can look at that detail as you look at each region in more detail, but that's it. Wow, how long is this video gonna be? I don't wanna know. Anyway, um, I hope that was useful. Um, like I say, if you want to find more detail, just search, you, you, know, you know YouTube's built on Google, right? And Google are quite good at search. If you wanna find any of these topics, just search my name, Sam Webster, and whatever thing you're looking for in Google, in YouTube rather, and should show you videos if I've ever made them. I think it, I think YouTube listens to what I'm saying and then like creates search things from what I've said, because I don't bother typing much in, but it still works. Anyway, enough of that. Oh, right, uh, time to tidy up and have another cup of coffee and I'll see you guys um, next week, no doubt.